So my topic is round cell malignancies of bone, imaging and diagnostic tips. I acknowledge my uh, esteemed colleague, Alexandra Fyodorova, who assisted me with uh, translating my uh, presentation to Russian. And uh, uh, as with Irina, um, my cases are mostly from the case records of the New York Orthopedic Pathology uh, Society, which is known as the New York Bone Club. So round cell lesions, what I'm going to do is uh, they're, 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 there's a long list of uh, round cell lesions, including osteomyelitis, Langerhans cell, histiocytosis, neuroblastoma, lymphoma, myeloma, Ewing, and then the various Ewing uh, type uh, disorders and metastases. I'm not going to do an overview of round cell lesions. I'm going to focus on specific teaching points uh, and tips relevant to uh, round cell lesions. So the hallmark radiographic finding of round cell lesions is this lytic permeative pattern uh, that we see. And it's not specific for benign or malignant. It occurs in all round cell lesions. And this is what we look for. When the, the lytic permeative pattern, these holes need to be small. When the holes are very large or larger, then we start thinking of vascular lesions. An example of a lytic permeative pattern that's benign is sarcoidosis. And here we can see a beautiful lytic permeative pattern also described as a lacy uh, uh, destructive pattern involving the proximal phalanges. And here we see non-caseating granulomata, classic sarcoidosis. Um, localized osteopenia, uh, usually post-traumatic, uh, also gives a lytic permeative pattern and can be mistaken for round cell infiltration, which we see right here. So not everything that looks like a round cell lesion radiographically is actually a round cell lesion. This is an important point. Uh, with lesions that do not destroy the underlying bone in architecture, but infiltrate with an edema pattern, always think of lymphoma. So anytime we have a funny lesion that seems to be infiltrating but not destroying bone, lymphoma is always top of the list. And now I'm going to focus on multiple myeloma out of uh, in the time remaining, just because there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, intricacies uh, and tips that uh, I would like to share regarding multiple myeloma. The presentations of multiple myeloma are varied. They can be simple osteopenia, which is the most common presentation, a lytic permeative pattern, classic for round cell lesions, expansile lytic lesions, or a sclerotic myeloma pattern, um, which uh, may overlap with Poems syndrome. And Poems syndrome is sclerotic myeloma along with polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, myeloma protein, and skin changes. So our first case, this is a 69-year-old female with Sjogren's syndrome and C5-6 cervical canal stenosis and cervical myelopathy who complained of intermittent headaches. And here we see a uh, scout view from a uh, CT scan and we see that there's this uh, lesion that's somewhat sc uh, sclerotic uh, in the uh, posterior calvarium. Axial CT slices show that the lesion is very well circumscribed with a Hounsfield unit even in the apparent uh, lytic area of 185 and 286. So that uh, implies that there is bone forming within this lesion or calcification forming within this lesion. MRI looks the same, shows you a well circumscribed lesion at the posterior calvarium. And the radiology differential diagnosis was osteoblastoma, Paget disease of bone, and fibrous dysplasia. But on uh, biopsy, we see these sheets of inhomogeneous, of a homogeneous uh, material that is uh, that uh, doesn't have internal characteristics. Uh, no, ca no calcifications within most of this. There's some foci of calcifications, and there is bone formation uh, surrounding it. And then there are small nests of cells. These uh, these look like plasma cells. And uh, indeed, they look like plasma cells. We see prominent Golgi bodies. And it's CD138 positive, which fits um, 
which fits the uh, uh, which fits plasma cells. Interestingly, Irina's case also was CD138 positive of the uh, Ewing-like adamantinoma. We know CD138 sometimes can stain for endothelial cells or epithelial cells, which fits the uh, uh, Ewing-like adamantinoma that uh, Irina showed. Um, this uh, case was positive for lambda and not for kappa chains, and Congo red stains positive. So this uh, case is amyloidosis uh, with uh, plasma cell neoplasm. Around cell lesion masquerading as a uh, osteoblastoma or something else. Now, multiple myeloma with amyloid may mimic chondrosarcoma. This is an uncommon appearance, but I'm going to show you examples. It's the amyloid that calcifies. Uh, and that uh, mimics the chondroid calcifications. This is a 48-year-old male seen because of a lump on the back of the head that was present for at least five years. The mass gradually increased in size, most notably during the past 18 months. No pain, tenderness, fever, or weight loss. And here we see this large mass with these densities, both on CT and on plain film, that resemble chondroid calcifications. These are the calcifications that can occur in amyloidosis, which is why amyloid, calcified amyloid uh, in myeloma can be confused with um, chondrosarcoma. Because of the small ring-like calcification seen on the radiographs, the radiologist felt that this tumor probably represented a cartilaginous tumor. And here we see the sheets of plasma cells. And this is uh, solitary myeloma with amyloid and calcifications. This is a 79-year-old male with right hip pain radiating to the leg and foot for one year, significant weight loss over the previous six weeks. And here we see this density in the right ilium with some speckled calcifications that resemble chondroid calcifications. With a mass, we see some speckled calcifications uh, uh, extending medial to the acetabulum. This too is suggestive of chondroid calcification. But here we see these deposits of, uh, there are some sheets of cells and deposits. This is, um, uh, this is polarized. This is uh, uh, amyloid deposition. And here we see sheets of plasma cells with this amyloid deposition. So this is, again, myeloma with calcified amyloid mimicking a chondroid lesion on imaging. Now, multiple myeloma can occur in younger patients, and it's important to keep myeloma in mind in younger patients, even though it's not common. This is a 23-year-old female who was noted by her hairdresser to have a lump over the vertex of the skull. She has been in good health generally, but recently noticed the onset of headaches and visual blurring when bending forward. Here we see the classic radiographic pattern of myeloma. We see multiple lytic lesions throughout the skull of varying sizes. When the lesions are all about the same size, we think more of metastases. When the lesions are varying sizes, we think of myeloma first. And here we see classic plasma cells. Now, multiple myel this is case was diagnosed multiple myeloma in an usually young patient, a 21-year-old. We've seen myeloma as young as 17, and it's an, this was a non-secretory myeloma. This is a 21-year-old, previously healthy male who noted a lump over the right tibia for one year. It was occasionally associated with aching pain, which increased recently. Sudden increase in pain was noted following a fall. And here we see there's an expansile lesion that is centric within the tibia with a, a deformity of the cortex, likely fracture. And on uh, sagittal proton density and T1 MRI, we see this lesion is quite homogeneous. And it actually, uh, the differential diagnosis radiographically would range fibrous, from fibrous dysplasia even to a, uh, a simple bone cyst. But uh, on pathology, we see sheets of plasma cells. And this was uh, solitary myeloma plasma cytoma. So 
And now to some teaching points about myeloma. Diffuse osteopenia is a well-known and very common manifestation of myeloma. So when screening for myeloma, the fact that there is osteopenia is already a sign of myeloma. The problem is that the uh, most common age group of myeloma is the age group where osteopenia is also common. And so even though it's, it's osteopenia is a common uh, presentation, it's not helpful as a differentiator. For a lytic lesion to be visible on radiography, 50% focal loss of bone must be present. But when we see these kinds of lytic, focal lytic destructive lesions, these are not the problematic diagnostic cases. Our problematic diagnostic cases are the cases where there's diffuse osteopenia and we don't have isolated lytic lesions. So diffuse osteopenia due to myelomatous infiltration and tumor-induced osteoclast activity is difficult to differentiate from postmenopausal or senile osteoporosis. And this is really the problem. Now, there is a problem using CT alone. Some forms of lytic lesions are similar to normal osteoporotic lucencies that we very commonly see. Uh, and if, if we chase down these types of lytic lesions on every patient, this is all we'd be doing because these types of lytic lesions are very, very common in patients aged uh, 50 and above. Detection of subtle myeloma is the key. It's not a problem to detect myeloma when there is diffuse skeletal bone destruction. When radiographs are compared with MR, high false negative rates between 29 and 90 percent have been reported for radiographs in patients with multiple myeloma. So radiography alone is not the way to screen patients. So when viewing asymptomatic patients with normal radiographs, MR depicts diffuse or focal tumor infiltration in 29 to 50% of patients. Approximately a third of patients are understaged if MRI is not used. So MRI is far superior for staging than plain films, but when lesions like this are identified, plain film correlation or CT correlation is important. When you compare the sensitivity of radiographic and MR examinations of lesions detected in the spine and pelvis, you see that a radiography detects 34, uh, 42%, while MR detects 76%. In the pelvis, radiography detects 46%, while MR detects 75%. But what's better than MRI is FDG-PET. The sensitivity of FDG-PET in detecting bone marrow involvement at initial diagnosis is 90%. Radiographically occult lesions detected by FDG-PET are, this is a good example. Here we see plain film shows nothing. The CT shows this lucency, which we have a difficult time dealing with, but the FDG-PET is focally hot. So we know that this is something to chase down, while an, an area of focal osteoporosis should not be focally hot on FDG PET. So FDG PET CT use in multiple myeloma offers important prognostic information on survival and risk of relapse, both at baseline and after therapy. Now, there is another uh, study that recently uh, was uh, published, which is I'm putting this forward to you as a cutting edge type where we're going. The authors labeled CD38 uh, specific single domain antibody with um, gallium 68, and they developed the CD38 targeted immunopositron emission tomography imaging probe. And what they found with this probe was that immunopet imaging with this gallium 68 uh, CD38 uh, probe that they depicted all subcutaneous and orthotopic myeloma lesions outperforming the traditional uh, FDG uh, PET. They, uh, they noted that uh, their gallium uh, 68 CD38 probe may detect myeloma involved bones without obvious bone destruction, which is what we really want because we want to detect myeloma at its early stages and we want to detect recurrences at their early stages. And so I put forward to you that uh, we may have a, a, a future in other PET markers for, uh, for myeloma other than uh, fluorodeoxyglucose.
And uh, I thank you very much uh, for this uh, invitation.